Uh, we have Steve Charbonneau, who's the uh, who's the medical director of pediatric emergency medicine at Franklin Square. Tammy Cotty, who's a uh, pediatric emergency physician at uh, Georgetown uh, in the emergency department. Uh, Dr. Keisha Bell, who's the vice chair for inpatient medicine for pediatrics and the chief of pedi pediatric critical care. And Fasil Gedichu, who's uh, the director of respiratory care medicine at Georgetown. Uh, and Eric Kreiner, who's a respiratory clinical specialist at Washington Hospital Center. Uh, my co-moderator, Dr. Diana Panku, is the associate chair of emergency medicine at Franklin Square. Uh, Diana is going to walk us through a couple of cases. Uh, I'll post a link to a guidance document that was put up by C4P uh, on high flow nasal cannula, which I think is well written uh, and might get referenced. Dr. Panky, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Manish. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are all uh, being faced with uh, managing uh, pediatric patients in the emergency department for prolonged periods of time, and getting comfortable with this is critical. The two cases we selected are cases from our own emergency departments. The first case was brought forth by Triple MC, and the second case, and that's an uh, the first case is a patient who had bronchiolitis. The second case is going to be a child who had asthma, and um, both kids, their triggers were viral infections, and this is what we're seeing these days: a lot of RSV, uh, rhinovirus, enterovirus. Dr. Bell helped me uh, through the management of the asthmatic patient that's going to be presented. And um, the first case, however, is the bronchiolitis case. So this was a seven month old female weighing about eight kilograms, presented with congestion and shortness of breath that had been ongoing for two days. On arrival, uh, the patient was afebrile with a temperature of with a heart rate of 168, respiratory rate of 32, and pulse ox of 92%. So 92% for a bronchiolytic kid, not terrible, and it gave us time, right, to start managing this patient appropriately. The physical exam um, revealed diffuse coarse breath sounds, some subcostal retractions with intermittent nasal flaring. And what I want to point out is that in this particular case, the staff, the clinicians did a great job at exposing the child and recognizing the retractions, both subcostal and the nasal flaring. And that's part of the trick with these little ones because they could be playful and smiling and be and, and be in respiratory distress. So, um, for this particular bronchi little bronchiolytic child, supportive measures were initially with supplemental oxygen via nasal cannula. And they started off with nasal cannula at a couple of liters and titrated up to four liters and then switched to high flow settings. Now, in some of these cases, there is a little bit of anxiety surrounding the use of high flow and uh, some clinicians um, may be a little concerned about potential uh, negative side effects of high flow. So we appreciate everybody um, providing information to us about when that conversion from regular nasal cannula to high flow should occur and what the benefits as well as the risks of high flow are. And the other thing that we wanted to bring up was the fact that this kid came in a little ill, but was on day two of illness. So we know that these kids progress over the next few days, and that's exactly what happened to this child because eventually this kid ended up in We lost you, Diana. You're back, Diana. And what we heard was eventually okay. this, it ended um, up on. All right, so the child was transferred um, after 24 hours of ED care to a higher level of care or to an equally high level of care, I should say, to a pediatric hospital. But for 24 hours, we managed this child in titrated high flow. So the question for our specialists, um, Fasil, Eric, uh, if you could please go through what the differences between standard nasal cannula and high flow, um, including you know the temperature and humidification aspects of high flow, and at one point we would transition from one to the other, it'd be greatly helpful. If Thank I you. could say something real quick before we move on to that, um, I just really like don't want to the the 
what you mentioned about looking at the kids under their clothes. That is so key. These kids, especially the ones in the onesies, where you have to get through all this outfit and unsnap them, they almost always get under triaged. So knowing, you know, if it, we can't rely on the triage necessarily, but when we bring them back, they have to be fully undressed, got to unsnap their onesies. So, sorry, just wanted to say that part. Okay, so low flow Sorry, versus yeah. high flow. All right. Um, so I, I think the difference between a low flow and a high flow concept is is really again where you need to start, and that concept uh, is how much flow you're providing relative to what the patient is breathing in. Uh, a patient has what's called an inspiratory flow demand, um, and that's the speed or the flow of gas as they are inspiring. Um, the flow in a low flow device delivered to this patient um, that is then inspiring is delivered at a flow rate that is less than the patient's inspiratory flow demand. And what you put the patient in a position to do, therefore, is to somehow and in some way entrain room air in addition to the flow of gas that's being provided to them. Um, and I think if the, the easiest way to think about this is that if you hook a nasal cannula up to the wall flow meter, that is 100% oxygen coming out of the prongs of the nasal cannula. Um, yet, two liters is somehow 28% in our minds or 26%. And that is because two liters is significantly less than the patient's inspiratory flow demand. That is in adults. When you come into the kids, you just kind of knock that down the line and down, down the, the flow graphic, essentially. So, but the concept is, is still holds true is that any patient will have to entrain room air over and above whatever you're delivering to them. The breaking point and where you kind of switch over into the concept of a high flow delivery device is when you are providing uh, a flow of gas delivered to a patient that exceeds their inspiratory flow demand. That is the very definition of what a high flow device is. And so, um, you know, a, a patient's inspiratory, a patient's minute ventilation is approximately 100 milliliters per kilo in the adults. I'm going to faint or beg some kind of uh, uh, help here when we get down to into the kids if we have an understanding of that, because that is where I'm going to kind of waver some. But if we say that a normal minute ventilation is somewhere around eight liters a minute in an adult, and an inspiratory flow demand is about three times that, three to four times that. And so that's why when we kind of cross over, and I know we have a bunch of adults, when we cross over from the adults into the peds, we think that we start adult high flow nasal cannula on 40 liters a minute. And that is the very reason why we do that, because a normal resting inspiratory flow demand of a patient is somewhere around 30 liters a minute. And so that is that definition of a high flow device. As we bring it, knock it down into the little kids, their minute ventilations are somewhere around two, three, four, five liters. And so, you know, you, you are just dealing with a smaller minute ventilation and therefore you have to provide a, a total flow of gas being delivered to them that exceeds the inspiratory flow demand of that particular patient. All right, and so that's the difference between low flow and a high flow device. One doesn't meet their full need uh, on, insp and on inspiration and one does. Now the consequence of providing enough flow to meet and exceed their inspiratory flow demands carries with it consequences because of the, because of the high flow of gas. The first and foremost one is if you send a high flow of gas into a patient that is dry and cold, it will dry out the nasal mucosa as it travels over the upper airway. As it then therefore travels down into the lower airway, you will disrupt ciliary uh, kinesis at that point. And so you end up with all of these bronchial hygiene and nasal mucosal drying uh, issues uh, as consequence of the high flow gas if you, if you don't condition it properly. Um, it makes compliance of the therapy very difficult and it results in kind of, you know, the bleeding and dryness of the skin and that sort of that sort of idea um, as you continue to provide that over a course of time. So it is mandatory that you heat this to body temperature and humidify it to 
Um, it is the adverse thing that comes with it, but it is also the helpful thing that comes with it because now you are promoting bronchial hygiene in which they may be operating in some sort of humidity deficit as well. So there's that underlying negative versus positive uh, switch as you go over to a high flow. You gain something by providing that to them. The other thing that you're doing to them uh, or for them is in providing them such a high flow gas for which they no longer have to entrain room air is that you will be able to provide them with a precise level of FiO2. Um, with a low flow device, it is just an estimate. And as patients' inspiratory demands go up, their rate and their volume, what they're doing is entraining more room air with a low flow device. And the FiO2 becomes extremely variable and, and in fact diluted way down than what you would that you, what you would expect otherwise. So being able to provide them with a precise level of FiO2, um, that's what you get out of a high flow device. The high flow of gas washes out dead space. Um, the last one third or you know, approximately of exhalation sits in your anatomical dead space uh, and is therefore inhaled on that next immediate subsequent inspiration. So you can think of it as stale CO2 laden O2 depleted gas their first one third of inspiration. The, the high flow of gas being delivered washes out the anatomical dead space and refreshes it with that conditioned gas that you have. So you're reducing the CO2 uh, evacuation load on the patient and making their minute ventilation more efficient. Um, and so you gain those kind of three really big benefits right off of the bat, right? Um, humidity yeah, can I effect too. Yep. Mm -hmm. Can I piggyback on what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, one of the benefits of high flow is that in that setting, so this, what you're just talking about, the dead space, I mean, this is the theory of why it works. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people, I think, think that high flow is delivering a pressure and that that's why it works. It's probably not that. So it does exert some amount of pressure. Like if you actually measured it, you could probably detect that there is a pressure generated from the system. But that's actually probably not why it's helpful to increase the rate. It's really the flow and it's the washout, right? It's the dead space, uh, the assistance of the clearance and that actually gives the person relief right so improving their death decreasing their de functional dead space and we know that bronchiolitics and asthmatics have that in common right so they have more dead space and so if you can help them decrease that dead space their vocal breathing will improve this is one of the ways that high flow uh, really does help kids um uh, and so yeah we're happy to talk about the practical parts of it but you know when we start high flow in a baby, for say, we might start at six or seven or eight liters total, right, per minute, uh, not per kilo, right? So it just depends. It really depends on the scenario. The smaller they are, for example, if I have a six kilo baby, I might not start at two per kilo, right? I might not start at 12. I might still start that kid at seven or eight. Um, it, you don't always need to jump exactly to two, but I also am not limited by two. So there are situations where I might actually go past that. And then, of course, as the kid gets larger, right, if we're talking about, let's say, a 15 kilo kid, I might not start at 30, right? So that would be unusual for us to start there. So we would probably start at much, much lower uh, rates than that. So the formulas are helpful to kind of think in the background, but the, the truth is it's a little bit nuanced about how how we actually start, what rates we start, depending on the age and the size of the kiddo. So just wanted to mention that as well. Yeah, I think Dr. Bell, I think one of the one of the other things that go along with that, you know, and this this happens in kind of real life is that uh, I'll make up the scenario that you picked low and you you undershot basically what you were what you needed. And so in your thinking and in your thought process and, and quite honestly, your assessment, as you go up to meet the need in your mind, you're like, wow, I'm really escalating this flow, right? And relative to where I started. And I think uh, a lot of times that's what I see. The problem that people get into is that the, the escalation of flow, because it is nuanced, I think you have to put that in your back pocket, that it is nuanced and the Escalation relative to where you started isn't necessarily where you go, where you're going to put your flag in because you may double it, but if you guessed low in a nuanced sort of way, then did you really double it type of thing, right? And so, I don't know. Can you speak to that because I I I see the declaration of failure of therapy 
relative to where they started, that's where people kind of spin themselves around in circles mm -hmm. that they think that they're in trouble. With. <clears throat> Maybe not. Right. Yeah, I mean, the context, you know, from which I speak is, is an ICU setting. So it's mm -hmm. it's always, you know, a little bit different, uh, I think, then because, you know, we have different nursing support. We, you know, it's, it's a slightly different um, uh, way that we deliver care. But I think the general idea is that, you know, we increase support until we think there's more threat to the support than the benefit, right? So it's always a risk benefit ratio, right? So if we're ensuring that the prong size is appropriate, right? So the prong shouldn't be more than half to maybe half to three quarter size of the nary. So it, when you're checking the prongs on the high flow for kids, make sure that the prongs actually fit. Most of the air leak problems like pneumothorax, et cetera, et cetera, have come historically from cases where the prongs actually were snug into, they were too tight. And so there was really no system there for escape. Um, so just make sure that the prongs are right. But my a point to, to your question about how do you increase? So we increase the support based on how the patient is doing. Right. So if the patient is still having work of breathing and I have this, let's use six months, let's use this baby, right? Seven kilos, eight months. Is that correct? So we started, um, how much high flow did we start on this kiddo? Twelve. Start Twelve. off with four liters initially. Right. Of, oh, of, yes. Four liters to the of wall. Flow. Four yes. liters to the wall. Right. And then for high flow, we started, we went from four to how much? To 12 and then eventually to 16. Okay. So we ended up with 16 liters, right? So in a kid who is six months old, I have taken care of babies who have had to go to 20 um, very carefully, uh, watching them very closely, making sure that, you know, the patient is, you know, really doing okay. Uh, and I've even, in one case, I remember this baby distinctly, a six month old, I actually had to go to 25, which is very rare. I, I, I've only done it once. Um, it did save that baby though, I, I do think, from being intubated. So there are times when we are escalating therapy, but it's, um, uh, it's based on how much we want to tolerate. So I think that's the other difference in settings. So in the ED, I, I, I feel like because you're dealing with emergent situations, you are going to, it, it may not be as easy for, for you to overlook some, not overlook. Um, I have a friend who said, Keisha, aren't you worried about the CO2 at 60? In my setting, a CO2 of 60 with a good pH and they're ventilated, I'm actually going to just say, hey, let's watch it. I might not make a change. But in an emergent setting, if you have a patient come to you off the street, that's concerning, right? So you would want to do something about that. So I think that the differences in approach to patient care will come out as we keep patients longer and longer in the ER. Because if I had that same baby and you said, hey, Keisha, I'm calling you because I just checked a VBG and this kid's CO2 is 55, let's say and they're doing fine on 15 liters, or at least they're kind of only doing fine. She's still breathing in the 60s. If that child's in the ICU with two to one nursing and all the support that they, I'm actually gonna just say, let's watch that kid. Like I, I may not escalate therapy on that kid. Whereas I think for the ED, it's, 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 it might be a little more uncomfortable to do that. Does that make sense? Like I can see why it would be more uncomfortable to do that. That's all. Dr. Bell, it does make sense. And uh, there's a question in the chat. Um, which which also pertains to a question that I have for, for you, for Eric and for uh, Facile. We try to simplify, you're talking a lot about flow and it seems that especially for these bronchiolitic kids who are breathing very rapidly, we're focusing on flow. So I've heard it simplified to titrate flow to work of breathing, titrate mm -hmm. FiO2 to pulse ox. How accurate is that? And is there a max on the flow that we are considering for a particular weight or sized child? So it is accurate. the first thing yeah. you said to separate the lines of there. So how well is a person oxygenating and how well are they, how are they struggling with their ventilation, right? So I do separate oxygenation and ventilation. Um, so I wean them separately. Right. So when I have a patient who's on high flow, I don't consider um, like if they're having trouble holding their sats and I want to go up on the oxygen because increasing their flow is probably not really going to help you with their oxygenation, to be quite honest. Um, so we do we do separate them. Uh, what was the second part of your question? I don't, and I think someone else may want to jump in as well. Yeah, I, I would I would say that I, I, I think that's why I hooked that idea of 
Respiratory rate rolled into minute ventilation is what determines how fast the gas is coming into or how fast the patient is inspired, right? And so if you really separate this out, if a patient is is the KIPNIC, um, that, is, that, is a, that is a flow resolved idea that you have to make sure that the flow that you're delivering to them is meeting and still exceeding their inspiratory flow domain. I think I think Dr. Bell, where it does become tricky is that if you're under delivering flow in the face of oxygenation. So if your flow is low mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they're desaturating, then the right answer is not always to increase the FiO2. It is actually just mm -hmm. to provide them the right level of flow yeah, of that gas can be true. at yeah. that FiO2. And if you meet and exceed their needs, then they no longer mm -hmm. have to entrain room air and they oxygenate better. So I would say on the way up, as long as you are providing enough flow to them, one and a half to, you know, two liters per kilo, then that's your that's your and space in which you're titrating the flow. Eric. Yeah, yeah. I, I, to add on that, uh, another thing like Dr. Uh, Bell mentioned earlier, when the high flow technology uh, was rolling out and uh, down the road when uh, you know the different competition came as far as different uh, high flow brand the pressure piece was being uh, targeted as a selling point you know you get a 10 centimeter per liter flow mm -hmm. so you know there was we were preached that but it, of course you know that didn't get proven from experience we know uh, that wasn't true uh, but there was that confusion where well, that's why we all always want to start conservatively because we think about, oh, I don't want to put too much pressure. Uh, I'm going to share now as far as you know what you asked. Uh, earlier. This is. What we use here as far as, you know, uh, based on the patient weight. Uh, less than five, six, and eight. Uh, you know, uh, uh, liter flow versus uh, high, high and low, and five to ten, eight to fifteen. You know, so on, forth and so on. I know we're working on this package of education to share with you know the entire group. We're working on clinical guideline, just you know to uh, add on what Dr. Bell and Eric was saying. If I can make a quick comment about that, I, I think. As, as emergency physicians, emergency providers, we don't always think about flow. Uh, and, um, and just to kind of um, uh, consider what Eric was saying of our inspiratory flow relative to the flow of the air or the, the gas that's coming at us from whatever device we're choosing. And when, when I talk to our residents about this, I think about our inspiratory flow for if a patient's really dyspneic, at the beginning of their breath, when they start inhaling, when they have the biggest pressure gradient, they may start out that breath at 60, 80, 90 liters per minute. It's going to be much less than a child, but it's really high and it's unusual that we're able to match that. If we can't match their inspiratory flow, they're going to pull in room air. They're going to dilute whatever gas we are intending to deliver to them. And um, and so to get to Eric's point, there's I think a really important point there of you've got to try to um, match or just exceed the patient's inspiratory flow. That's hard because we don't know what that is and we don't measure that. So you, so as as best as I can see from the different guidelines, is you're kind of trying to estimate that based on the size of the patient. Um, and you know to Candace's question of the is there a kind of a ceiling? Uh, my interpretation of that is is yeah, you want to try to go just above their in, their maximum inspiratory flow rate. And as long as you're above that, then you're just going to be titrating FiO2, if I'm understanding that right. Um, yeah, OK, um, so um, can, can I can I leave you with this analogy? And, and I always think of this. Um, uh, if you if you're in your car on a very, very cold day, you have the same two controls on your heater. You have the temperature and you have the fan speed, essentially. The temperature is your FiO2 and the fan speed is your flow, right? And when you first get in, you put them all on full blast, right? But they are independently controlled and they affect that situation that you feel differently. I think about this every winter I'm driving in the car. I'm like, this is high flow. This is how, how you do it, right? Because I can leave the temperature at its max. But if I turn the flow down too low 
and it's on the very lowest flow setting. Though I have the highest temperature, it's going to get cold. It's going to get really cold. However, if I turn the fan up and now it's really, really blowing at me, chances are I can turn the temperature downwards because the, the air around me is now being overwhelmed by the warmness that it's overcoming the cold on the outside. And I think about that every time, that analogy, that it's the exact same concept of flow and FiO2. It's temperature and fan speed when, when you're talking about the heat. And so that's the game that you're playing, right? And especially with the flow, because if you turn it way, way, way down, it doesn't matter what temperature you have that on because the cold from around you is going to overwhelm it. All right. And so that's the analogy that I kind of leave, leave that management strategy with is that you got to have enough flow. You got to, it's like putting a non rebreather on an apneic patient. <laughs> like you got to be breathing in order to get it. Right. And Eric, oh, you said wait. something earlier, Dr. Bill, I think you both said this, um, something similar to the, you use the flow for work of breathing. The one of the piece that I'll, the, the connection that I want to make sure is clear there is that's because the work of breathing is going to be driven by the hypercapnia. Is that is that right? Assuming the hypoxia is managed, it's yeah. you're increasing your flow to try to maximize clearance of that dead space, try to ventilate off that dead space. Is that right? It's right-ish. So what yeah. I mean by that is <laughs> you, you can have a CO2 that's close to, let's say, in the mid-40s or even 50 and still have significant work of breathing. Okay. Just because you don't have normal elasticity and sure. compliance and all those things are disrupted by this viral process that this patient may be in. And so they are they may still be hair hungry, right? Even if they are kind of meeting the numbers. So sometimes the numbers look fairly okay, but they're still working. So we do see that. Would, so it's not all that. I, I would I would say it's also rate linked, right? Like the that flow is rate titrated to rate. Right, because because work can work. The, the ideology of work all the time is you have to overcome a, a, an elastance load and a resistance load. Mm -hmm. That's the ideology of work, mm -hmm. right? And in these kids, the ideology of work is 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 a resistance load, right? And so if they're tachypnic, it's a flow answer. As their tachypnia slows down, you know you 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 are going to be providing enough flow but you still have not spoken to the resistant load that they may have to overcome. Now, they may be able to get by with minimal to moderate work of breathing on the low flow nasal cannula, but, it, but if it's excessive, now you're talking about an inspiratory pressure to help overcome the work that they have. And then therefore, that's kind of as you roll forward into yeah. escalating. You, you bring up a good point, Eric, because I think that the, the the decision point of when you'd go from high flow to let's say non-invasive positive pressure, right? That's always a clinical judgment about this high flow system is actually not enough, right? Mm -hmm. So even though I've gone up and I'm at a pretty decent, you know, rate right here for flow, uh, I feel that this patient's work of breathing is not sufficiently supported and I need to go to another mode. And so trying to determine that, some of it is, honestly, some of it is kind of clinical experience. It's just looking at the patient, trying to see how am I comfortable with letting this patient sit here like this? Um, and, and that it, sometimes it's made easy for you, right? Sometimes you can just check another gas and it's worse. <laughs> sometimes there's CO2 70 now and you're like, I need to do something else. And it's clear. And it's not always that clear though, right? When to, to move to the next step. But we have to think about that in the back of our minds. When we're escalating high flow, what's your limit for this patient? How can I support this patient? When is it not enough, right? Those are the things. Dr. Bell, I'm going to ask you to, to come back to that because the specific question we want to address is um, what's the difference between BiPAP? When would you move to BiPAP? But there's a couple questions in the chat that I want us to address, uh, and I'll read the first one. It's can you can you provide tips on how to address agitation and fighting the nasal cannula among our younger peds patients other than a burrito roll? Anything else you have you've had had luck with, especially with higher flow rates? Honestly, the kids who really need it don't usually, um, the kids who are really working usually tolerate it. And, and it's because they're working so hard, they don't have time. They, they really don't have the energy to fight it. They might be kicking and crying a little bit, but usually you can keep it on them. I have found. Um, 
that I have not had to sedate a kid like I have an asthmatic who won't keep their NIPPV on. <laughs> now that that is absolutely the case. So the older, like a three year old, may not you you may not be able to get away with putting on an IPPV when you need to. So in those cases, I have sedated the kids um, with. I mean, I've used different things, but sometimes we'll use Presidex, sometimes we'll use ketamine uh, to, to improve mask acceptance in that age group. But under 12 months, you actually, once you have it in position and taped well, um, either over the ears and under the neck or behind and kind of secure it, usually they fight early and then they kind of just get over it. They kind of are like, hey, well, this is it, so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think as long as you're heated and humidified, uh, right. well, you, you end up you end right. up tolerating that. You know, the just the the really super granular technical aspect of it is that this often goes on in a really emergent type of situation, right? And so we we assemble the device, we hook up the tubing, we hook up the cannula, we get it onto the patient, we turn it on, and we go. Uh, but that gas it takes a, a period of time to heat to essentially ninety eight degrees. Uh, and 100% humidify. So the, for me, always in an application, those first five to 10 minutes are always kind of hairy because it is, it's going to be cold, dry gas yeah. until that heater is able to heat the gas up enough. Um, you know, that, that's just me walking into that situation, always knowing that the first five to 10 minutes is a lot of handholding um, in, in the application of that. Those are great points. Would you say that if a child isn't tolerating it, is that a suggestion that maybe the flow is too high or no? What do you mean by not tolerating it? Uh, agitated, moving their head about. I mean, there are a lot of reasons they could be agitated. They might be hungry. Yeah. They might be, I mean, there, there are a lot of, you know, so assessing that, I think it takes an assessment to figure out why is this child like this? Yeah. Um, it could be the flow. But I haven't found that someone who needed the escalation is more agitated when they get to something that's supportive. Does that make sense? So if you're escalating it and they need the support, they're not going to be more agitated because you've supported them better. Um, it just may be that they're old enough to be angry. They could be hungry. They could be tired. Uh, there, there are lots of things that, that could cause that agitation. So I wouldn't necessarily use it as a singular clue that my flow is too high necessarily. Okay. Great. Yeah. Dr. Grad, the tolerance actually, whether it's adults or uh, pits, high flow versus non-invasive BiPAP is much better actually when you get to the full face mask and that kind of thing, the pressure, that's where uh, it's difficult to tolerate. And I wonder if we can then, um, Dr. Bell, you mentioned v uh, blood gases. Can you comment on VBG timing um, uh, for, for this patient population? Um, <laughs> Timing and frequency was the question. I so I don't routinely get gases on bronchiolytics, um, even when they're on high flow, and I, I usually base it on I'm getting a gas if I'm worried. Like I I usually get it when I'm worried, um, and so if I end up with a bad result after I'm worried, then I need to figure out what I need what I can do differently clinically to support the kiddo. But if I happen to get a gas randomly, let's say the resident ordered a gas and I didn't know right on this bronchiolytic, the gas is fine or marginal, then sometimes I'm committed to rechecking, right? Like if the CO2 is in the 50s, and I'm like, eh, you know, you can go up on the flow a little bit and recheck in a few hours, you know, so sometimes that's the right answer. Um, when a kid is truly sick, I mean, like, you know, they're breathing in the 80s and they won't stop. Right, they're, they're just going for it, head bobbing the whole nine. Then that is the patient that I'm probably more likely to want to investigate a gas. An average bronchiolytic who comes in breathing in the 50s and 60s, I'm not really sure that I need it. I mean, you could get a baseline if you would like, just to reassure yourself that they're clearing CO2 fairly well. Um, but I don't know that it's mandated. It's just like chest x-rays or even albuterol, right? So albuterol is not is really not indicated for most bronchiolytics either, unless they have a family history of asthma. Um, you could try it. I think many people end up trying it just because they don't like to see the kid working like that. And they're like, maybe we could help this kid with a neb. Um, but overall, the practice is really not suggested to even do bronchiolytics long-term for, bronchi for um, 
uh, bronchodilators for bronchiolytics. So I think there are a lot of ways, we, we really wanna make these kids better, but the truth is these, these disease processes just take time. They take support and we have to watch them. Like we just have to watch them work sometimes. Like they have to just get through it and we support them the best we can. Yeah. Same um, with steroids, like they don't need steroids. Like, so, you know, all these things that we would love to do, they don't need methyl cred, right? If it's just, you know, garden variety RSV or non-RSV bronchiolytics, same way. Um, can you all comment on the potential adverse effects of high flow nasal cannula? Eric, you talked about it in the context of if your tubing isn't humidified and heated. Um, other other adverse effects? Not not many unless you don't allow the alleviation of pressure. Uh, in in that speaking to nasal prong size, right? And so if you get the nasal prong size right and you have you have washout. Uh, then, you know, relatively speaking, uh, it, it, it is a safe and effective therapy for this for these guys uh, without many, you know, without a extensive side effect profile. Um, most of it comes from tolerance and and the flow of dry gas. Uh, I think the only other thing that you got to kind of have in your back pocket, perhaps, uh, is gastric distension because you're introducing flow and a little bit of pressure. Um, but not typically with high flow. It's usually with non-invasive that that comes into play, but not typically yeah. with high flow. Yeah, yeah, we normally don't have to support yeah. gastric or alleviate gastric dist distension on these kids. Um, yeah. Not the same way as you do sometimes with non-invasive. Yeah. You definitely see it more often with um, mm -hmm. full face or nasal um, non-invasive support. So. Um, it's rare. I mean, honestly, I've never seen a pneumothorax from high flow, but mm -hmm. that would be the, I think that's the thing that people worry the most about is mm -hmm. that this kid's going to develop a pneumo. They don't usually, especially if the prong size is appropriate. If you look in the literature, I would say probably 10 to 15 years ago, you saw a few case reports. All of the case reports were related to prong size. So if you get the prong size right, you, you're by and large going to avoid kind of the uh, air leak issues. And just so I'm clear on that, that's that the prong size is too big, it, the diameter mm -hmm. is too large, mm -hmm. and that doesn't allow yeah. leak. Is that, mm -hmm. is that correct? Okay. Correct. Mm -hmm. or, yeah, uh, advantage to us, almost every single device in the market come with the sizing chart. Also, I think rule of thumb is it has to cover at least 50% of the air. Uh, and other Potential problem when you use this long term, of course, because this is a foreign device attached to our skin, uh, there is a risk of pressure injury. Uh, other than that, really, not a whole lot of problem. However, and along so with that can come permanent blanching, depending on the longevity of the high flow, as well as uh, septal um, breakage as well. So those are things that need to be looked at uh, on a long term basis. So there are many products on the market, right, with all sorts of colors and so forth. But what we need to take away is just the size of the prong, not the color and so forth. Just yeah. greater than 50 percent, but no greater than 75 percent of the of the size of the nostrils. OK, yeah. and I think there's, you know, so there's interface and I can, we'll we'll wrap up maybe this high flow if you're ready to move on. Uh, but but I want to leave us with this is that you know, there there are, you know, really kind of essentially three main high flow delivery devices that are dedicated for being flow generators. That's all that they are, uh, is just a flow generator. Um, there's three big ones out there. Um, uh, and then there's, you know, our, our ventilators that are standardized throughout our system also provide high flow. Um, so, when we when we talk about the delivery device, there's really a, a wide variation throughout the system on the high flow delivery device itself. Um, you know, the the small uh, work group um, that's the the with the respiratory therapist uh, that is working in in tandem with the sprint group that is going on in this space right now. You know, we're working to really kind of standardize. We we as much as we can, the interface as well as the delivery device within people's capacity. Um, if you're not used to treating kids in your ED, I think what you can expect is a really standardized approach 
to the equipment that is going to be used in the philosophy that it makes education easier. It takes the, the stress off of the bedside clinicians. How do I set this up? And I have all these different options. We're going to give you hopefully one option for the delivery device and one option for the the interface. Um, I think we have a I think we have a direction in which we are going. Uh, and this you guys would make. Um, I'm sorry. Pop up. Uh, oh, uh, I think we have a direction that you're on, going. Um, and this group, you know, I'll make it available yeah, through yeah. through Dr. Goyle here that you know I'll provide you you know with pictures of yeah. this is what you can expect. Uh, um, this is what you'll waiting. see. Um, just so that you're not like, oh, I thought we were doing high flow. Like, what, what is this type of thing? OK, so um, just to, so that we all know that there's a lot of different flavors of this that really make it complex. Is Thank it, you, Eric, uh, and I, I know that we're going to be speaking more about uh, BiPAP uh, during the asthma case as well. Uh, but there was a question um, in, in the chat that perhaps we should just address now before we go forward. It says, uh, you know, some of us work in pediatric EDs without BiPAP. Um, and so how do we how do we make up for the lack of BiPAP for now? Uh, but I think that there's also some um, facility. Maybe you could speak to the fact uh, that we are actually working on providing that support to the EDs. Thank you. Uh, yeah, correct. Uh, so I had collected an inventory for a different assignment uh, with the Sprint group. Uh, all of our uh, ventilators, you know, we acquired right before COVID and during COVID uh, are capable of providing invasive and non-invasive therapy and a high flow too for pediatric. Go, they go from pediatric to adult. Also, we have uh, the new EV300s for those who are from respiratory, you may be familiar with them. They have actually a wider range, which will uh, help us uh, take care of uh, those you know, tiny ones coming through our doors. Uh, we are working, we're finalizing the education package where Eric touched on earlier as far as, you know, a standardization of the type of uh, disposables and, uh, you know, what, where the start point will be, that will be coming for the respiratory theme and you know whoever is interested we have a week long day and night shift uh, education coming up so from what we have seen uh, you know the adult units we invested on in the recent past uh, whether it's here you know every medstar hospital uh, you know i'm aware of we have a couple of options to be able to provide non-invasive therapy Dr. Bell, just to, to tag on to that, the question uh, that, uh, that was asked, there, there's a specific question about what rescue medications, and if you can specifically address NEBS, steroids, and 3% uh, uh, saline, because it sounds like there's maybe some ambiguity mm -hmm. about those interventions. For bronchiolitis? Yes, for, asthma. for bronchiolitis. So the indication for steroids is pretty minimal. So there's not much indication for bronchiolitis and steroids. There's uh, also not much indication for albuterol, except if there's a known family member, right, who has a family history of family having asthma, uh, may confound that particular bronchiolytics course. And so they may uh, have a reactive component to their disease. And so albuterol is suggested that you try. Right, so you could give them a, a dose, see if it helps. If it doesn't help, then I, you know, wouldn't necessarily try it again. Um, there's very little role for continuous albuterol, you know, in a bronchiolytic. Um, and three percent, so three percent can be helpful. The one thing we know about three percent is that it doesn't change the overall course, so the person will still be sick for X number of days, whether you use three percent or not. Uh, so it doesn't make them better faster, but sometimes it makes them look a little better. And that's fine with me. <laughs> like, so, you know, we like that, right? So we want them to look more comfortable. So we use it. So we'll use a 3% med. Um, I'm definitely not opposed to doing that. And it really does help with their secretion sometimes um, to, to use a 3%. If you can try to mobilize them a little bit, it may help. You said something really I'll interesting there, which is kind of family history based. W would you say that that would also alter your decision to try steroids? Uh, maybe. <laughs> Bronchiolitis is really just not, it's not a disease process that is improved by steroids. Yeah. 
I think that's the whole. So when I was in residency, I'm I'm older now. So when I was in residency, we used to give everybody steroids. Like that was the thing. We just did it. And we were just wrong, <laughs> truthfully. We just had no idea that we really weren't helping them. Um, and then we've got lots of data since then that's come out to say that steroids really don't help in bronchiolytics. Um, it's not the disease, pro it's not really what's going to help their disease process. It's different than asthmatics. So I'm like, can we get steroids into them within two seconds flat? Like, can we like, pour, can we anoint them with steroids? Like, can we pour it over their heads? Um, so it's totally different disease process. But I would also mention racemic epi that there's. Oh, no yeah. As well. Exactly. Agreed. Thank you for mentioning that, Tammy. So racemic is very similar to 3%, that sometimes you can see a clinical improvement to your eye for a brief period of time. So it can feel good to us to give, um, but there's no data that it actually changes the ultimate course of the disease. So we just have to give it knowing that, <laughs> knowing that you're probably not changing the ultimate course, but that they might look a little better for a little while, maybe. Okay. And just to make sure that I heard you right, 3% saline is reasonable. Racemic epinephrine is reasonable. Mm -hmm. Probably no, no role for uh, for steroids. Um, what, what did I miss? Any other meds we should be considering? Uh, I think we were talking about albuterol, but those are right, the only sorry. things. I think for long-term therapy, you have to consider that their insensible losses are fairly high. So these patients, be it asthmatics or um, Bronchiolytics come in usually not having done well with their PO for the day or two prior to presentation. So they usually come in dry. So I would address that with maybe a, a bolus. Uh, asthmatics almost always give a bolus too, and bronchiolytics probably need a little something as well to start. And then uh, making sure that they're on IV fluids, particularly the younger kids under 12 months, they need a dextrose solution. So just like D normal saline, D5 normal saline is completely fine to run at maintenance, but they do need something. Um, some kids I let eat. And some kids I don't. It depends on how they look. So that's and, also it's a judgment call. And so tell us a little bit more about that. Steve, I saw your hand up. We'll come to you next. Um, tell us a little bit more about the eating piece. That question has come up a couple times in the chat. And I know it's hard, right? Because you got to look at the kids. This is tricky. I mean, this is this is honestly what we what we're what we what we learn over time, right? In our fellowship is like how to judge when a child is appropriate for PO. Um, and when it's when is it okay to let them eat? When is it not? Um, it's hard to boil that down into you know a bullet. Mm -hmm. I would say uh, I've had bronchiolytics who were on some reasonable amount of high flow, maybe under twenty, you know, maybe fifteen or twelve, who could eat? Like they they actually can eat. Um, they're hungry. They want to eat. Sometimes they look better after they eat. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> so I'm like, they're just beside themselves because they're like so hungry they can't see straight. And no IV flu in the world is going to fix it, right? You can put them on fluids. They don't care. They're hungry. Um, and so if they can do it, then I sometimes let them. Sometimes going to the breast actually is a relief for them and they actually look more comfortable if they're breastfeeding or if they can get a bottle. So it it really... I'm reluctant to give anyone set guidelines on who can eat and who cannot because it is strictly a judgment call based on each child's presentation and what they look like. Dr. Bell, and I, I just I, put in please, a word. I love yeah. having a PICU colleague jump in. Thank so, you so much. Um, hi, everyone. This is Mega Fitzpatrick. I'm one of the other pediatric intensivists. M my um, rule for eating a lot of the times is based on trajectory of illness. So I'd like you guys to consider the total picture. Is this patient getting better or are they? not changing or are they potentially getting worse? So I might not let a kid on six liters eat because they look worse and they're getting worse by the hour and I've been going up on their respiratory support. Whereas a kid on 12 liters who's sort of getting better, has a respiratory rate that's better, has good perfusion, um, otherwise is not having any issues, I might let them eat. So I have to tell you, I mean, it's not, you know, the best answer, but I look at trajectory of illness and I look at things like their perfusion, their interaction with their environment, or they're working so hard that they really are just focused on breathing, or are they basically like a happy little Tikipnik kid? Um, you know, and then in that case, then maybe you would be a little more liberal with eating. So the whole reason to not let them eat obviously is is mostly related to whether or not we would want to intubate them at some point, but can also be related to the amount of flow. So if they're getting, you know, 20 liters blowing into their stomach, they might vomit and we don't want that either. So um, 
I think a good rule of thumb is probably not initially until you get a good sense of where the kid is going. And then once you've established a trajectory of illness and you've given them a little bit of support, you can think about what eating might look like. So if you're looking for like a hard and fast, that's what I would say. I would say no. And then as you figure out the kid after a couple hours, then you can probably give them something depending on what they're doing, if that makes any sense. It's a great point and it highlights why this conversation is so important, right? Because as, as emergency physicians, emergency nurses, emergency providers, we generally don't watch people over a long period of time, right? We're used to the children coming to you. Um, and, and so a, a previous question that was asked was, as this is subjective, what would you say are some of the objective data points we would want to sign out between the multiple dots that are caring for these uh, children over, you know, a day or a couple of days? Um, you know, for me, obviously the respiratory exam would be the first thing. So, mm -hmm. and, you know, in the PICU, we look mostly at trends. So I'm less interested in what the latest set of vitals are, but more interested in over 24 hours, what things have been happening or over the shift. Um, what has the trend been? The respiratory rate has basically been stable. The respiratory rate has started to increase. The respiratory rate has come down. The patient looks more comfortable. Um, and then work of breathing is another big one, right? So um, is it mild, moderate, significant respiratory distress? And what does that look like to you? In older kids, it's easier because we can use language. Do they have truncated speech flow or are they having a normal speech pattern? But in babies, it's a little harder. So are they able to eat? Have they been put to the breast? Are they able to suck and swallow if they are eating? Um, and then for us, you know, perfusion and pulses are really, really important. So what do their feet look like? I'm less interested in what their, you know, hands and feet. What do their hands and feet look like? I don't really care about femoral pulses as much, but um, what's their cap refill? Uh, if they have a fontanelle, what's the fontanelle doing? Is it, did they come in and it was sunken? You've resuscitated them now, it's normal. Um, you know, is it, do they have a fever? Have they developed a fever? And then blood pressures. I mean, those are all, I think, the basic things, but mostly looking at trends that will give you clues to trajectory of illness. And that'll help you guys decide like how to triage the kids, like who's kind of staying stable and who you really need to work on moving out quickly. And those yeah. kids with impaired perfusion are, are probably number one on the list. Mm -hmm. So for sure. Can I give a tidbit about feeding as well? So if you feel like a kid is looking okay and you might want to try feeding, there is a definite clinical clue that they can't do it. And that is if you put them to breast or give them a bottle and they cough. If there is coughing at all or sputtering or choking, just stop. Don't, this is not going to work out. So I think it's, that's something that you can definitely put in the bank, right? So that's a hard and fast. Like if they just can't do it, they won't necessarily, they'll still want to. So that's what I'm doing. So they, they will still want to be at the breast, but they actually just can't do it. So that's a great, great tip, Dr. Bell. Thank you. Um, you, you mentioned a uh, bolus. A at what point would you start IV fluids? And actually, um, uh, Steve and, and Tammy, can I get your opinions on that? Since you're seeing these kids in the ED uh, of when, at what point would you start IV fluids? Sure. Um, a lot of kids are definitely going to have increased fluid needs due to their fever, their tachypnea, um, decreased fluid intake, their respiratory distress. If it's just a mild case of RSV, they, they wouldn't need fluids most likely. But the more moderate, um, severe cases um, where there's nasal flaring, significant retraction, cyanosis, um, and, and the other when you're going on high flow, often that's kind of an indicator to make the child NPO. But going back to our last discussion, it really depends how they look, right? If they're if they're improving rapidly with high flow, can maybe consider holding off on IV fluids just to kind of get a sense of where they're going to fall. But someone who's needing escalating care, I think at that point it's a it's a safe assumption to go ahead and start some dextrose containing fluids. Most likely, these children are going to be fluid down. They're going to be NPO for a while at that point. If I could ask uh, Keisha and Omega, we would never um, truly consider weighing diapers or in the emergency department. Um, but, you know, these kids are staying in our EDs now for two, three days. At what point would you recommend that we start considering something as crazy as that for, for us? 
So, okay. So uh, in inpatient space for kids, and I have two partners, I think at least two partners on the call. So please both jump, Jess and Mega. So please jump in. Uh, on the floor, the way they do eyes and nose is they just document that it happened, right? So a void is considered a void and it's kind of a check. Like we know they're vo they've voided six times in the last 18 hours. And honestly, for kids who aren't that sick, that's adequate. We know that their urine output is decent. They've urinated a number of times and that's okay. In the ICU, we are, first of all, all of us have OCD and we like to know ex all the details. It's important, right, for the care. So we actually do weigh every, like we weigh, we know exactly what the urine output is in cc's per kilo per hour. <laughs> um, but I don't think that you have to uh, do that in the e I don't think, so partners, please jump in. I feel like documenting a void is important though. Knowing that the person is voiding is really important to to gauge their, their volume status. So it, uh, Mega, Jess, yeah, I would agree. Tammy, I, I would come back to this idea of trajectory of illness. So, Diana, to answer your question, you know, if the kid comes in, starts having, you know, deep, uh, prolonged cap refill, you're worried that they're not taking enough in, you're not really sure what's happening, then I would probably start being a little more closely watching their eyes and nose. But if they're feeding well, or you look, you know, the mucous membranes are moist, they look good, they're getting better, I wouldn't even consider it because on the floor we would definitely not do it. Um, but I, I guess the thing that is most important about these little kids, especially like the less than six months that come in, is that they can sort of go down pretty quickly. Um, and so you just want to watch that trajectory of illness very carefully and that would include sort of um, their perfusion and uh, their work of breathing because that, that's those are the the kids that really you know the older a little bit older even greater than one year of age six to one is sort of uh, in between but one greater than one it, it'll take them a little while to get to where they are but you have a two month old a six week old in the ed that's definitely um somebody that I would establish IV access on pretty early and err on the side of giving them fluid as opposed to not and monitoring their output as opposed to not. That That's just my my thought, you know. If you called me, that's what I would tell you. Much appreciate that. So yes, we will err on the side of putting in that IV early and, yes. and starting hydration. And in the interest of time, and uh, Monish is texting me separately here um, to move things along because we want to make sure that we also focus on asthma or that sort of the different management between bronchiolitis and asthma, including a little bit of uh, talk and thought about BiPAP. When would we transition to BiPAP if it's a very sick bronchiolytic kid? Or when would we go to BiPAP if it's an asthmatic kid? And I don't think that, I mean, I could present the second case. It was just a four-year-old patient who present, had history of asthma and came in short of breath. And this was a very sick child, a very sick four-year-old who ended up requiring everything from the steroids and magnesium and continuous nebulizer treatments and um, we used high flow. We did not have BiPAP um, at our, in our ED. Uh, we did IM Epi, we did terbutaline, bolus, and drip. And so if we have time, I guess we will talk about all those other managements, but because today I think we're trying to focus on the respiratory aspect. If you could just talk a little bit about uh, BiPAP and and how asthma is different than bronchiolitis and when would we go to BiPAP? That would be super helpful. So Eric, Vassal, Keisha, Mega. So as don't asthmatics ever, are, yeah, I don't, don't know. everybody asthmatics jump in at once. <laughs> asthmatics are scary. Let me just say, I mean, they can. Yes. Do you agree, Fasil? I, I, I feel that they, okay. their risk is very high um, for arrest. Honestly, um, they have sometimes they are deceptively sick. Like it, you know, you look at them and you look at their respiratory rate, and you're like, oh, she's breathing in the 40s, but she's like working. You know what I mean? Like, wow, her respiratory rate on paper says 42, but she's like hunking over there you know so 
the amount of support that they need can change drastically in not that short a period of time where you start continuous, you give them the steroids, and then like 15 minutes later, they're like not able to. So some of the clues of when you know you've stepped into some dangerous territory is when you have someone who's tripoding, reaching forward, right? Sitting there, not able to speak to you, can't finish the sentence. Um, these are things that make me worry. Intubation is also challenging for an asthmatic, right? They're usually volume down. So you want to make sure that they um, are, are replete somewhat when you go to give them those meds. Um, and they're also doing a better job of ventilating themselves than you are going to be able to do on a vent. So, our, so we, uh, we underestimate the work that they're putting in. So when we put them on the vent, very often we find that we're having to use enormous like settings in order to match what they were actually successfully doing. Um, so it, the decision to intubate an asthmatic is a tricky one that uh, I think takes, takes a lot of thinking. Am I missing can, something? Can I can I just clarify when you're using the term BiPAP, you're referring to non-invasive positive pressure ventilation with yes. pressure support and PEEP, not necessarily like the machine of the BiPAP. OK, so I just um, I think in the difference between bronchiolytics and asthmatics, I would say that it's very rare for us to use initially NIPPV for bronchiolytics other than high flow and sometimes we use bubble CPAP which I don't know if you have available to you. I think if we were getting into the sort of space of needing a face mask on a little tiny baby I think we'd probably all intubate that kid um, before you know we got to that but we have a pretty big leeway. So in, in bronchiolytics the issue is often apnea especially if they're younger. Um, as opposed to needing the respiratory support, although they can also need that. But I think you have a longer time to sort of getting to that needing of NIPPV beyond um, uh, either the high flow or uh, nasal like CPAP or bubble CPAP that we use. I think in asthmatics, it's very different. Like Dr. Bell said, I, I think we do. I know Dr. Bell and I, when we trained, there was no high flow for asthmatics. We didn't do that. Um, so this is like a newer thing that we're getting used to, but you can try that, um, but I think we would probably go over to NIPPV a lot sooner in asthmatics, ones that are struggling to breathe, having difficulty clearing their CO2, um, you know, looking like they're going to tire. We've had more success using NIPPV with them than we have with the bronchiolytic set. So I think usually the kids are older, they're able to tolerate the mask a little better, and I would say that we would go to it a lot sooner than um, in the younger bronchiolytics. Does that, is that what you were asking? Okay. I don't know, Dr. Bell, and I think Dr. Chang is here, if anybody else has any Dr. other Chang thoughts on here. that. But. If Seal or Judy, if Judy's yeah. on, a anyone yeah. from RT have any comments about that? Uh, hi, this is Judy. So, hi. Judy. Yes, hi. Uh, yes, we do uh, use a lot. Uh, we don't use a lot on for a, uh, high flow for asthmatic, but then also there is uh, a way we can do for the youngest one uh, for NIPPV, which we can use the ramp cannula if they are under four kilo. It was, I was reading some research done, which patient much better done with a mask and then ramp cannula when the baby's like less than four kilo. So, and that is what we use in the, for, um, RSV kids is usually like high flow, which is like again, uh, you guys already talk about it, how like the how we can pick the flows and then versus like the cannula match. And I think that's where work. And the other thing is like for uh, NIPPV, we've been struggling to have a good fit maskers. There is not a lot of pediatric maskers and on the market. And we rarely use like for uh, scuba mask for us and here in Georgetown. And there is uh, a little bit like difficult to do NIPPV patient like the youngest one with the mask. It, uh, so it's difficult. One thing we realized, you know, we were recently assessing, you know, what is available commercially in the market in the form of um, full face mask for, you know, our young, smaller uh, pediatric patients. Uh, 
the success is, is, is very difficult with the full face mask. They will end up rebreathing the CO2. They will end up, you know, worse than where they started with. So the nasal prong approach is much better. And uh, like uh, like Fitzpatrick mentioned earlier, and Judy, uh, the nasal uh, or the ram cannula, for example, or the nasal CPAP should be, you know, you could re deliver pressure. Uh, instead of a high flow, you could uh, deliver it, use it as an invasive. That's probably more uh, fruitful uh, alternative. So let Very me, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, well, th there's certain market barriers right now. So I'm going to speak kind of broadly and, and I think more specifically to the the institutions that do not take care of the kids and what space that you're going to find yourselves in. Because I think what we're working towards as, as a respiratory work group, and we already alluded to it, is kind of standardizing the interface and the deliver devices for those folks. Not not trying, not wanting to or intending to or, or, or changing anything with anybody's established practice. These are for the new, the new guys, new kids on the block. Um, there's a device that is called a RAM cannula that is out there on the market, and what you are able to do with this particular device uh, is not only deliver high flow, but you're also able to deliver non-invasive ventilation through the through the RAM cannula with some degree of success. Um, it, the the literature it, it's throughout the literature. It is not in not a very specifically FDA approved uh, indication for the use of the RAM, but it is all throughout the literature and a well accepted practice. Uh, many of the larger uh, academic children centers. This is how they do this. Um, so I think what we're leaning towards in for the kind of the, the new kids on the block, essentially to the peds area is the interface you know that we're going to recommend is probably going to be the ram cannula uh just for the ease of education the the ability to transition between high flow and non-invasive um and also the very real market condition that's out there right now um you know i was alluding to it in some pre-conversation uh you know in the adult world you know there's I, we can go to any one of 15 different vendors to try to get an adult non-invasive mask um there's two for the peds that's it um you know there's there's a full face mask uh and a nasal giraffe mask that is made by the company phillips both of those right now as of this morning i just talked to the rep this morning to get really good clarification on how I would navigate these barriers, but the the lead time on on getting on getting those non-invasive masks is eight weeks right now, at its very best, and he couldn't even guarantee that. Um, he said it's going to be difficult. You, he told me look somewhere else. Um, the only other company that second one is called a Noni N O N N Y, um, and I have uh, I have the lead and the call out to that particular vendor right now. Um, I don't suspect that it's going to be much better because everybody's in the same boat right now is trying to get the same thing in a really really limited supply. So therefore now you, that's what the realistic world looks like here. So I think what we're going to be recommending instead of the nasal masks, which you know, are have their issues with a child. Um, the the number one reason for failure of non-invasive therapy, whether it's an adult or a child, is is compliance. That that's why these guys fail across the board. You can't get them to wear the mask. They don't tolerate the therapy. Whatever have you. Oh right? no, we, we we can fix that. You can fix that. Yeah. Oh, we um, can absolutely fix that. Yeah. <laughs> So, so as you transition away from the mask and something that may be better tolerated, you land on this idea of a ram cannula, right? And so uh, that also, though, carries a bit of caveat to it and, and a bit of, you know, uh, an education gap that, you know, really, really needs to be addressed, I think. Um, uh, providing non-invasive ventilation through a ram cannula. It, it absolutely can be done, but the trans, if you want to kind of think about it uh, in a logistical aspect, you're asking a machine to target a pressure by driving flow into a, an interface. If that interface, instead of a mask, is a prong, a much smaller, more highly resistive nasal prong, the machine interprets that it hits its inspiratory pressure because of solely the resistance of the gas flow going through the, the smaller prong. 
And therefore, if it's hitting its inspiratory pressure, the, the whatever the delivery device that you're using will then start to back off on flow because it's met its pressure goal at that point. The pressure distal to that obstruction in fat air quotes is much lower than what the what you're seeing at the machine. So there is a bit of nuance and gut feeling and kind of you have to kind of feel your way through because if you set this patient on what you think is an inspiratory pressure of 15, the very real situation is, is that the pressure that the patient seal it, seeing is uh, some degree much less than that. You know, it, it really depends on the amount of pressure, the size of the nasal prong, but I can guarantee you uh, throughout every, throughout all the literature and all the bench research, um, and, and whatever in vitro studies that, that are able to be done with pressure, um, that pressure that the patient actually sees it is much lower um, on the other side of that ram cannula. And so the numbers that you're talking about um, in terms of clinical utility and clinical assessment become somewhat nebulous because you're, you're having to titrate pressure based on a clinical condition, not understanding what the pressure is actually that you're using, right? That's the drawback with the ram cannula. Uh, and, and quite honestly, it, it's it's what we're going to end up being stuck with. So it's kind of we, we got to get to that point. If you're in a facility that is that this is already within your supply chain and you have your stock and that's you, you have a nasal mask or you have a full face mask and this is your practice. Um, but for the other folks that have never this is a new thing. Um, this is kind of what we're working through right now in the standardization of that. All right. Uh, the in addition, the the delivery device for that, you know, it, it can either be the the invasive the the mechanical ventilator that we all have, and we can all train on just putting the servo in non-invasive and try and doing it that way. Or we all have an EV300, which is, you know, the big brother, the next generation to what we all know as the V60 or what we commonly call a BiPAP machine, all right? So, um, so there is some standardization that we can do, which will kind of streamline education and kind of streamline, you know, practice on the therapist side, as well as, you know, the prescriber side of things and kind of ease this forward as we go into, you know, the very real logistical, implementation and provision of non-invasive ventilation. Um, but those are the little things that like we, Cecile and I and the other therapists think about, like you can say we want non-invasive and that's great, but we got to think about like how, how are we going to do it? And, and understood that those are the roadblocks that have been put up, you know, prior to, you know, just because. Hey, can I, you know, can I interject something, Eric? Yeah, when we're talking yeah. about putting positive pressure on children, the mm -hmm. monitoring is really important. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think that whatever nurse ratio you can get down to as, as low as possible would be helpful to make sure that those patients are remaining stable, that there's no untoward event. Um, there's always a risk of a pneumothorax. There's all, depending on the disease process, it's even more likely. Right? So asthma, asthmatics are going to have a higher risk, even in bronchiolytics. Um, so I would just try to incorporate kind of uh, as much monitoring as you can. If they end up there for longer than 24 hours, we generally do an x-ray every day on someone who's in positive pressure um, to ensure that, you know, there are no significant changes. So I would kind of put that in the back of your mind, too. Um, and then their nutritional status. And if someone's on IV fluids for more than a day, we'd like to check their lights as well. So I know we didn't get into the granular part. So like what happens if they're in your unit for longer than 24 hours? But I think trying to remember all that, like their nutrition, their electrolytes, because you're giving them fluids and who knows what's, if, you know we're hardly ever right, right, with our IV fluids. So just making sure that their lights are okay. And so those are the th maintaining their urine output and monitoring it, so. Dr. Bell, I want to- Just want to throw that, that in there. Yeah. What, th those, are, those are actually really important points. So I want to go back to that mm -hmm. um, the, on these kind of daily things that we need to consider and when we need mm -hmm. to consider them. Um, I think I heard you say if somebody's on IV fluids, daily labs, a daily x-ray, mm -hmm. if positive pressure, does, does high flow, is that included in that or not? I wouldn't. I wouldn't okay. do a, da a daily x-ray on a kid on high flow. Unless, okay. you know, unless they're too. clinically indicated. Well, yeah, they're getting of course. Worse. <laughs> right. If they're yeah. getting worse. But, yeah. but not um, just because they're on the high flow, right? It's right. No. Some, Only kids else. that are intubated. But if they're clinically getting worse, then whatever you're doing is not helping, then I would definitely yeah. Um, and, and Eric, I, I heard you say eight weeks a lead time. Are we still 
proceeding down that path? Because one of the things that I'm worried about um, from what I'm hearing you describe with this RAM catheter, it, and again, it sounds like it's a device that is unique in that it can deliver non-invasive positive pressure ventilation via a nasal cannula device. However, you're describing a significant pressure drop based on the resistance in that tube, and that maybe creates a scenario where we don't know how much pressure the patient's experiencing. Um, and, and I think what I worry about in our environments where we don't use non-invasive in children at hardly ever, and now we're introducing a device that's going to make it even less reliable and less accurate, I don't know that it makes sense to introduce it into into that environment. I, I don't I don't know that I would either introduce a new therapy into a situation as such as this. And so can I take this opportunity just to make another point? So Please. I um so I think the answer for the whole country right now is to get more beds. And I think that's that's a, to, to facilitate the people who care for these children to be able to care for the children. So if I were to if you were to ask me what would be my answer, I would say give us beds and we'll find nurse we'll find some nurses i don't know how but would be that we could take these kids like i don't want you so i really don't want you all to have to do this like this yeah. is not on our wish list right so we as picky docs as peds hospitalists we would much prefer to be able to take all the kids in the system with beds that were reallocated to us so that would be my first choice um and i think everything else that we're doing to try to work around the fact that you know we're not able to to do that um it is that it, we have to accept that this is it. These are workarounds, right? And so they're not going to be uh, ideal. Uh, we would take the patients in a heartbeat, right? So in a New York minute, I would take all these kids, um, like to, today, like right now. <laughs> but but we can't. Um, we haven't been given that opportunity. Uh, but there is a pediatric surge, and so you know, there's. Um, I think we we don't know what next month will bring, right? So we're at the beginning of what is a normal season for us, and we're already at a peak that we haven't seen in a long time. So I do worry that this is going to get worse before it gets better, and we may even have to readdress, like, how do we address pediatric beds in our, in our system? For this Actually, Ke Keisha, can I make a couple, just a couple comments based on the, these kids Please. being in the ER? Sorry, this is Heidi Appel. I'm also one yeah, of the PQ I, attendants. Yeah. And just listening to you guys, I think the important thing is to remember the setting we're in and what your um, the capabilities are. So the 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 important thing is to intervene early. So in terms of you might not think a kid needs an IV right away, but truthfully, you should put it in because the longer you wait, the harder it's going to be. And remember, your nurses are not used to putting in IVs in little kids. Um, like Mega and Keisha said, we wouldn't use BiPAP in a little kid because is there going to be a nurse there or a respiratory therapist sitting at the bed? I mean, side, I know you guys are busy with adults besides the, the surge in kids. So um, those that those babies are not going to keep the mask on. A bigger asthmatic will, and that's not as much an issue. But if if you feel like this kid is going downhill and needs bypass, they actually need to be intubated. Um, so it's just remembering what your resources are and anticipating the worst because these kids go down fast, and it's better to intervene early before that happens. So thanks. Hey, thank really you so nice. much, Dr. Penn. Are there any so, questions from the from the group about any of this? All right. So this is uncharted territory for all of us. You know, we're trying to figure out, like, what can we do? What are our options? What kinds of materials do we need? What kind of human resources do we need? Any thoughts from the group, from anyone attending the conference today? I mean, I, I think I think we all agree with your sentiments on the primary thing that we need is space and beds and, and clinicians to care for these kids in ICUs, right? That's what we need um, in the yeah. in the kind of where we are. Um, I think one of the, the kind of points that I heard there towards the end was, um, you know, be mindful of your threshold to intubate. BiPAP is probably not the answer for many reasons um, for these children. Maybe not in your in your older asthmatic. Maybe that's OK. But in terms of introducing BiPAP in an environment where one, you're not used to it, two, we may or may not have the equipment to be able to safely do it. By that, I mean these RAM catheters. Um, um, three, we're not gonna have the nurses and or respiratory therapists to, to hang out at the bedside to watch these kids. I think we have to have a realistic threshold to intubate. Uh, well, Manish, though, I would, I would, the only thing I would add though is like, 
you could intubate these kids, but then having a six week old or eight week old mm -hmm. intubated in your ED, that would be a one to one patient in the yeah. ICU, right? And so you would need to have somebody that can manage the ventilator, that can do the suctioning, that can tape, that can adjust the ET tube. Um, so it's not, you know, agreed, it's it's a different path, but you'd have to have adequate sedation, you'd have to have access. So, I mean, it's also not ideal in that scenario. So I, I just, yeah. I put it out there because I, you know, honestly, what we would probably do in a lot of these bronchiolytics is to hold off on the high flow as long as we possibly can and keep going up as much as we possibly can. And, and like mm -hmm. Heidi said, anticipate you know being dry put the iv in early make sure that they're getting adequate hydration but intubating it, it you're it's probably better in a lot of these kids than than the bipap or or we don't have the access to the non-invasive the cannulas that you guys need but i will say that intubating and, and especially in that very small age group it's it's going to be tough and, and those kids sometimes are difficult intubations too. And especially some of these kids that are coming in that are ex preemies, um, you know, you're getting some of those ex preemies <clears throat> that, that are gonna be, you know, maybe they have subglottic stenosis, maybe they have some other issues. So, um, and then that's a whole separate class of kids, right? Who might need a little diuretic, who might need some other things because of their pre-existing chronic lung disease, so. I would just um, echo Dr. Bell's sentiments that, you know, we're here and we're ready to we'd be happy to take care of them, but um, it's it's a tough situation. And, and there's another suggestion. Sometimes it's like, like I said, there's a, the RSP is like under two years. So we can do the RAM like a non-invasive if we really think it's like the patient is not, you know, the kids is getting a little bit worse before we intubate. And uh, RAM is more like the, it's more like high flow. They tolerate it a little bit better than the mask. Now, since we don't have uh, these RAM prongs, uh, but we do have um, BiPAP masks for small adults, what size child uh, or what age, average age child could theoretically use a, a small mask for positive pressure non-invasive BiPAP or CPAP. What, what's the translation there? It depends on the, what you have available. So it it's very local. It's locally determined depending on what mask you have and whether you have enough, um, whether you're going to do nasal or full face because that, that poses a different risk, right? So the face mask for, for non-invasive is riskier, right? Because if they vomit, there's it's fully sealed. Um, it depends on what you have available to you. I, if I were going to, if you were going to, if you had to do anything, I would choose the nasal prong over all of the other because it, it it's safer. Right, so they may not get what you think they're getting, but it's not, uh, I don't think as risky as someone with a full face mask, which sometimes is what we resort to, in, but we don't like it. Um, it takes a lot of monitoring. So I think if I had to choose the three of the all the three, I would choose nasal first, if I had to. Like if you feel like this is your, you had to make a choice. Um, and just so that you're aware, the ram cannulas, I can get you, I can get them to you tomorrow. Um, uh, those are ready, readily available. Um, so that that's the rest of the story about the landscape of what can and can't be done based on the availability of those things. Um, and you wouldn't uh, know the difference right now if you were to look at a patient with a ram cannula, you would be you would probably be hard pressed to notice the difference. Uh, in, in a high flow nasal cannula versus that ram cannula, um, you, they, they look exactly this, nearly exactly the same. They're they're a little softer. Um, the 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 walls of the nasal prong are built a little bit differently. Um, but but what you kind of consider the high flow uh, nasal cannula device is, it, it's not that far of a leap to go into the ram cannula. You wouldn't notice the difference. Um, it's pretty subtle. It's what it is able to be hooked up to, which is kind of the, the game changer that you're able to hook it up to a low flow oxygen source versus a ventilator circuit versus a non-invasive circuit. It's kind of multifaceted in that way um, and it's able to kind of span the spectrum of that acuity. Uh, 
level. So as far as the supplies, uh, similar to you know what we went through during COVID, uh, you know uh, we are getting into this actually with a better game plan, but uh, all the way up. Uh, to corporate leadership, we have a support now. You know, those of you who were with me yesterday in the sprint meeting, you know, we have been given uh, assurance by Dr. Boyle. Uh, if you know, once we identify what we need, definitely it will be work at the highest level. Uh, but like Eric said, you know, we reached out to our regular sources, and you know what seems to be available in abundance is this RAM cannula and a different version of it is available. I had a vendor in the building today who came to me with a sample showing me her product was better, you know, uh, that. Uh, again, during COVID, one of the lessons we learned, we never really always had the first choice. So we went to option B, option C, option D. We were able to, you know, provide safe care to our patients and uh, we're figuring this out now. And uh, I'm excited with the background work that's uh, happening. <clears throat> I could speak of uh, the respiratory support, but uh, this is, you know, there is telemedicine piece, and you know, is everyone is hands on on this. Is uh, uh, we're not gonna fail. Um, Doctor uh, Goyal, I have a quick question, and I, I don't know everybody's names on the call, but are our nursing colleagues on this call as well? We have many nurses that okay. had initially signed on. Yes. OK, and, and is there ongoing efforts for supporting them in all of this? Because um, many of them are not, you know, pediatric nurses and it's a lot to ask. And we also, you know, have they may have specific questions for nurse educators and things like that that are ped specific. So I, I just want to make sure that we're supporting our um, nursing staff in all of this. I'm sure you are, but you know it honestly like the whole part the, of an ICU pediatric ICU or neonatal ICU that makes it what it is is our nurses um, it's not us it's them they provide this extraordinary level of care and support and knowledge and so um, and it's our therapists and the support staff that's really what makes it that environment and so I just want to make sure that we are um, able to help them learn and grow as well uh, in this journey. Yeah, no, I, I completely completely agree with you. Um, I can't speak to what training there is that's ongoing. Um, Dr. Scotty, Charbonneau, thank you. I don't know if any of you are able to. Uh, Dr. Boyle is actually, I, I see her name. I am not sure if uh, she would be able to comment, but she is leading a sprint team with regards to overall pediatric care in the ED uh, for the ICU level. And it ha it's multifaceted and, uh, and part of it is uh, for the providers, uh, part of it is for RTs and part of it is uh, for nurse training and support. So yes, mm -hmm. that is also taking place in the background and uh, there's definitely a lot of attention. And we do have nurses on this call as well who have been asking questions in the chat. So I'm hoping that everybody is learning from this particular educational session, but there will be additional educational uh, support for the nursing teams. Correct. <clears throat> All the nursing leadership team from every entity and uh, the, uh, they were represented as a CNO and VP and uh, nursing director level in that. So 